joining us. The objective of this podcast is to give you a peek inside our editorial process. What happens is people send submissions in the regular uh, through Submittable, and we call through them as we do. And every now and then we go, hey, this might make great fodder for a podcast. And we contact the author and ask them if we can. And gratefully, wonderfully, our authors have been so generous in allowing us to do so. I think, gosh, we're almost at three years, you guys. Uh, Yeah, March 27th will be the beginning of our third year. We're two full years. Yeah, March 27th. Yep, yep. And and in that time, so (laughs) few people have said no. People are usually very happy, and we often get, um, you know, notes afterwards, and and we're we're so glad. Uh, It does make me feel uh, closer to our readers and our authors to be able to do this. So yes. thank you for listening. And um, and yeah, I think without, well, no, what am I doing? What just happened? Too much coffee today. And I'm angry about the CBD, but we're not going to talk about that. I have another story I would like to share with the group. But first, I would like to say, um, I'm Kathleen Volkmiller. And I've been saying the I and the we without saying who I am. Kathleen Volkmiller, co-editor of PBQ, SEist, uh, Professor here at Drexel, and uh, we're in the Corman studio in Philadelphia, and happy, happy to be here with Joe Zhang, our sound engineer. Woo! <laughs> and to <laughs> my right is an exciting newcomer, you know me with the new, loving the new, uh, we have Zoe Heller on the mic. Hi. Woo! She's Welcome. A, she's a grad student <laughs> in the publishing program, and she, if you've been looking and enjoying all of our fabulous social media slushies, it's uh, it's Zoe that's doing that for us. <laughs> it's me. So, yep, yep. You have anything you want to say? I'm no nope. excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> All right. All right. And also in the studio is Tim Fitz. Hi, I'm Tim Fitz. I've been uh, reading with the Painter Bride Quarterly for about five years. And I'm the author of two short story collections, Go Home and Cry for Yourselves and Hypothermia. Woohoo. Woo-hoo. All right. And we have, it's been such a long time since we've heard his voice, but Jason Schneiderman is in with us today from New York. Hi. I missed you guys too. Mwah. Well, talk to us, honey. Oh, I'm in, I'm in, um, <laughs> oh my God. Um, I'm in my office. I'm back in lovely Tribeca. BMCC classes start on Friday. I am so far behind. I will never catch up, but I am so happy to be back with you guys. Yay. Yeah. All righty, and out in the desert. <laughs> there are two of us out in the desert, but in two different locations. <gasps> this is Marion. <laughs> um, Marion Run. I'm the director of the writing program here at NYU Abu Dhabi. I'm one of the many eyes in the we that makes up PBQ. Um, thrilled to pieces to be in this conversation and want to second with Kath- what Kathy said about this work, which is it's amazing to be able to pull the veil back, so to speak, and share. Um, the great pleasure of talking about the submissions to PBQ um, and to be able to share what it means to be a literary editor in the 21st century in a completely different time zone than my friends and colleagues, Uh except for Samantha. Uh So Samantha, (laughs) where are you, lady? Hi, um, my name is Samantha Nukabauer and I'm um, a couple islands away from Marion right now, <laughs> um, in Abu Dhabi as well, uh, on El Reem. And, uh, I'm an instructor at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I've been involved in Painted Pride Quarterly and PBQ for a couple years now. And I just want to say that I'm really loving the enhanced social media presence. Um, wow. so kudos Thank to you. all of you for that. That's mm-hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sad that you're both so far again. It was lovely to have a moment with you, Samantha, and lovely to have the moments Thank I had you. with Marion. And I just I just want to take a minute to tell this story. So Marion and I, for all of our years together, um, when we do good cop, bad cop, I'm the bad cop. OK, <laughs> let's just start with that. Marion okay. just walks, moves through the world, committing acts of kindness like like a fairy. <laughs> Like a fairy, <laughs> just like blessings upon you all as she passes through. <laughs> and um, she was at my house. And I know you guys have heard about various stories about the cats and about oh. flea protector oh. and all sorts of wackiness that goes on with cats. And because I'm still, those three cats might live in my house right now. I am still going to try very hard to define myself as not a cat person. <laughs> and I am so not a cat person that Marion was... Uh, sitting at my my uh, 
island in the kitchen and <laughs> one of the newer cats came strolling by and we named her Peppa. <laughs> <laughs> and we <laughs> and uh, she was born in July, and uh, that's a whole other story. But the cat strolled by, and I said something. Oh, push her out of the way! And Marion looked askance at me for just one second, one eyebrow raised slightly, and she <laughs> said, uh, "Honey, I think <laughs> I think Peppa's name should be Pekka because them's balls." <laughs> <laughs> She gender ID'd the cat. I did. I did. They were some big balls on a little cat. <laughs> we had no idea. We thought it was her butt. Yeah. But it, yeah. was, it was his <laughs> balls. We don't know cats, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is, this is we my have a evidence. colony of feral cats. <laughs> this is my evidence of why yeah. I am not a cat person and why I should not be entrusted with these cats. I had been wondering why. Peppa was being so vicious to her own mother, right? Always yep. causing trouble. And I was like, girl, calm down. Girl, chill. <laughs> <laughs> and here I had it all wrong. So Marion's <laughs> fabulous mother uh, reached out from the heavens as well. Like just miracle, miracle sent me a text, right? <laughs> you got to take the cats to get fixed here. And, and we literally ran with cats in boxes. Yep. Yeah. So that Pekka could uh, keep it, keep it, keep it down, <laughs> and there wouldn't be more cats. In yes. This, in well, the, wait in a second. Speaking of more cats, zone. Jason, didn't you say you've got a feral colony? Well, like, no. I was just going to say that we we had a we had a, a we had um, we have a colony of feral cats, and we had a cat Stripey, um, and we always thought that Stripey had a very very oddly shaped um, vagina. <laughs> so one day I was like, that, th "Those are testicles. That that is not that is not a yeah. child. That is that yeah. is that that's great. definitely those are some balls. Why why is their genitalia so mysterious? What is that? Is I'm glad to hear that story, <laughs> Jason. Because look thought... at it until you do. <laughs> right. That's like, right. Felt... Unless you're a vet, you only yeah. really see it when they show it to you. Like you're not. Like, yeah. Or I'm what? not. Uh, okay. <laughs> anything well, to get a better look. I'm still going to say I'm not a cat person, and I'm still going to say I'm so grateful for Marion because I really could have had another an impregnated cat. And yeah, I'm, that you would have had you another. Might, you might also throw in you're not a biology person. <laughs> either. You might want to toss that into the mix. Sure, yeah. sure. And yeah. I'm so grateful to your mom. Does your mom listen to this podcast? We should we not should enough, make her. But we should make sure she does because one she of the things that she sent you was also episode. an anatomy, an image of the anatomy of a cat. She's been so <laughs> helpful during the whole cat, cat process. When the cats mm -hmm. came upon me, she's been uh, indispensable. <laughs> and and I, I am going to write the story about what happened at the neutering center. <laughs> I'm not right. going to tell that. Marion already knows right. it. But yeah. Right. Anyway, well, there's no segue whatsoever, guys. I got no transition. Zip, zero, <laughs> nada. Uh, just gratitude to Stephanie Bolster. We can pull that gratitude thread back out and say, Stephanie Bolster, thank you so much for allowing us to read your poems today um, on our podcast. Uh, listeners, always remember, you can go to pbqmag.org and read along, read ahead of us, read behind us, <laughs> whatever you need or want to do. Um, but the words are on the uh, screen there. So, Stephanie Bolster, who would like to read? Oh, come on. I know you love to read, Jason. I know you love to read, Samantha. Um, do you want to start with Ancestors? Yeah. All right. Ancestors. Stephanie Bolster. We didn't know them. They're in us the way a mirror is. Whomever they loved, we never knew. There is a mouth in a photograph that has a certain heat, but we do not know that mouth. It is whose we might have kissed had we been then. It is a stitch missed or loosed a twitch resisted. They held their heads still, which gave them the look of stone or ghosts. Eyes held open so they are the dolls they played with. Porcelain, chips hidden under the hair. Lie them back and they'd shut into their carriages without a hum 
their skin, the dusky gray of dust, even their hair, past gloss and pulled so taut it hurts. Great reading. Thank you. Nice, nice, nice. I really admire the way this poem tumbles like at the sentence level. And I mean that like, not that it stumbles, but that it like image tumbles into image syntactically um, in a way that is really compelling. Mm-hmm. I think well, the, the, the syntactic units like vary dramatically in length and the line takes a really great advantage of um, how those clauses are kind of being strung together. Yep. So at times you'll have like three or four in a line and they're just kind of lined up and they create all these sejuras and at other times they kind of like go all the way across. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, listeners, when you take a look at this poem, if you look at the end of the second line, right, you get uh, the phrase, there is a mouth. And then if I skip the third line, right, that mouth, right, comes back into the line to end the sentence. And then the next thing you get is this magical thing that that Jason read so beautifully. It is whose we might have kissed had we been then. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And as, as I was listening, I'm thinking this sentence is going to implode on itself. Like it's just, it doesn't make sense. And then it makes perfect sense. Right. And Mm -hmm. I, that, that risk and play is really pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. Um. I love where this poem goes, uh, deconstructing this photograph of our aunt's ancestors. You know, uh, certainly that's a thing that we may have seen before, but um, not not with these approaches, not even from, well, <clears throat> whomever they loved, we never knew. What a thing to think about. I loved that line. Right. Mm-hmm. And then to zero in on the mouth. And mm-hmm. and uh, if you don't skip that line in a photograph that has a certain heat, but we do mm-hmm. not know that mouth to focus mm-hmm. on the mouth. So so uh, for so many mm-hmm. lines. Right. Um, I, I would like help, though. I love the line there in us the way a mirror is. But I would like help with explicating that they're in us the way a mirror is. I have to say initial read. It pushes me. Out, not in. Um, well, especially I, after that title, ancestors doesn't isn't that evocative, really? No. Like somehow, I mean, I end up getting rewarded after, but like right. initially, I was going, eh? Uh-huh. not so happy. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I I liked that a lot because I I do think there's like a way that you see yourself in ancestors, like particularly like now, everyone is really concerned with it, like the twenty three and me and all this like DNA testing. Mm-hmm. And so you keep seeing yourself in things, but you're not really there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I like the idea that like the way that a mirror reflects back an idea of yourself to you or a version of yourself to you, that the picture of the ancestor does a similar work that you kind of, you see yourself in it and you're looking for some kind of origin. You're looking for some kind of truth about yourself there, but like the mirror, it's, it's simultaneously a truth, but also not yourself. That it, it offers this version of identity that's actually not in you. It's so close mm-hmm. to being you, though. When you think about the mannerisms that you pass down and the mannerisms mm-hmm. and all of the tendencies and the attractions, there's just a very thin layer of consciousness that's missing. Mm-hmm. But it's so close. I was looking at um, when... when um, my kids were like four. My oldest daughter was mixing her ice cream. She was put in a little milk and swirled it around to as a cream. The exact mm. way that my brother did when we were kids. Mm. And it, yeah. I was, for yeah. a minute, I was back in 1977. And I, she had never seen me eat it that way. Mm-hmm. It was just this mannerism that's connected. And he tells me about how his kids do things that I do and mm-hmm. And um, but it's so interesting because you're you're there and not there at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right. You right. just don't have access right. mm-hmm. to the consciousness of it, mm-hmm. and, unless they're right where they, we we um where we can our memories can be embedded into our DNA. 
We just don't know that we have the consciousness. Right. Right. And and, Absurd. and all of that is making me think <laughs> or Jason will never buy into that. But in, in the dead center of the palm, I also love uh, they held their heads still, which gave them the look of stone or ghosts. And mm-hmm. what Tim just said makes me think back on that line, too. Like what's what what's fascinating is that's all those ancestors. That's the only forms they can be now. Right. They might be right. marble casts. They might be gravestones. Right. Or ghosts. Yeah. So I think that for me, if to go back to the the line that's puzzling to you, Kathleen, or kind of pushes you out there in us the way a mirror is, takes me back to that fourth line again, right? Which is it, we would have kissed them had we been then, right? Like had we been alive then, there would have been intimacy with these people. Right. But we're not in the same time zone, so to speak, right? We're at different um, you know, in different periods. So we only know them through these photographs. So there's like a deep, deep alienation at the heart of this identification, right? There you're, you're both present and absent, deeply absent simultaneously. And that to me goes back to the first line there in us, the way a mirror is, and you know, three cheers for grad school. I can't not hear Jacques Lacan in that line, right? Like thinking about you know, the, the, the symbolic movement of the child through a mirror phase, recognizing that you're not part of the mother, that you are separate. And that's how you gain your identity yeah. is through lack is through separation. Right. right. So I, that to me is like the genius part of this poem is like, it's a poem, like it's a praise song for ancestors. That's also about complete separation and alienation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from them as well. Right. So I, I think that duality is pretty rocking. Yeah. Yeah. And you just made me think too, that, when we look in a mirror, we're never really seeing ourselves, right? You never really right. ever see yourself. And yeah. Yeah. and you so you look in these ancestors for self. You look in the mirror for self. Mm-hmm. But it's never going to be mm-hmm. exactly true. Right. There's a great um, passage in the beginning of that newish Tommy Orange book, There, There. And it's about... Um, the the first kind of protagonist uh, looking into a mirror and seeing oh. his face and saying, you know, how he will never see himself and how, um, and I think this, this goes back to what Jason said and this kind of like this thin, the thinnest or the closest version of ourselves that we will ever see is in the mirror. Um, and I think like in some ways, like mirrors too kind of, play into, especially in the second half of the poem, like the the elements of like the macabre that are here a little bit, Um, especially when we kind of get to these dolls and uh, porcelain and chips hidden under the hair. I think it gets a, a, there's a little bit of a spooky feel to it at points. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's just because of I'm putting this all into context of, you know, they're looking through a dusty box of photos or something like that. But I I do feel that when I read this. Well, no. And also, I mean, they kind of turn into the dolls that you're playing with, right. But like Mm -hmm. by having the photograph of the ancestor, you know, people who are long dead, who were photographed with technologies that are long out of use and, you know, like they become your toy, right? Like that you're playing with them the way that they would have played with their dolls. And I, th- I think you're right. Like there's something like really genius and macabre and kind of like recreates mm-hmm. the, um, that initial separation with the mirror, right? That, it, mm-hmm. that, that distance, that inevitability of distance kind of keeps emerging into the poem in a really powerful way. I think you, I think you put it perfectly. Huh. Um, I don't want to rush this, but we do have two more by the same poet. I'm wondering if we are already ready to vote or if there's other things we want to talk about right now. I think we're ready. And the room wants to vote. How are you guys? Yeah. I'm ready to vote. All right. All right. So uh, we have caller enters this time. So Joe will read your texts and thus us in the room will do our usual one, two, three thumb, right? One, two, three and it's unanimous. Woohoo! Woo-hoo. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie Bolster. That's one out of three. Done and in, and so happy. And um, now we have the zone. Marion, Sam, either of you are you are you afraid? I think so I We've I want to read this, but I am afraid as ever of being raptured. 
All right. right. Well, so, well, we if, know that if, going in. Today we're having a okay. problem where you kind of uh, dip into a lower thing, but you're being recorded correctly. We're having trouble on the headphones, but okay, we and, can still hear you. Okay. And on on my side, every once in a while it, it goes blank, right? But if you're able to hear my voice consistently, I'll just go for it. Totally Ready? consistent. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's called the zone. And this is a second poem by Stephanie Bolster. And there's a footnote that I'll share. It says um, at the end, note, Andre Tarkovsky's film Stalker was released in 1979, seven years before the Chernobyl disaster and 40 years after uh, The Wizard of Oz, The Zone. In the film Before It Happened, there is no answer. There is no question. What you wish, what you wish for is better left unknown. The water they lie in, flotsam and fishes. When they enter the zone, there's color. This happened decades earlier, when the house landed on the witch. It's never easy in a place of color. Each leaf interrogates beauty. In both, there are dogs. For men, a place of freedom. Far enough inside the self, there is no self outside. His wife tells the lens, She could not have lived a different life. She covers him with a jacket. While he sleeps, their daughter moves glasses with her mind through the pipe of fear to wear. They call it the meat grinder. Downstream from a chemical plant, it seeped their depths into them. They met it in reflections. You can't go back the way you came. Next time we'll be different. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start by saying this, which is like, a, you know, maybe a sophomoric way to look at it, but I don't have familiarity with the film. There are lines of this that I'm grooving on, but I really feel like I should know the movie to have a, a rich experience. I felt that a little bit, but I do think it is still very strong rain. For what I don't know, I, I really... Like it, I like the last. I think the last stanza was a great, solid ending. Mm-hmm. Because even if you didn't understand the whole poem, it's just I like it. Okay, <laughs> so you didn't feel at a loss without ever having seen no. the film. Okay, no. Yeah, I only felt it when they talked about for men a place of freedom. That's where I was like, oh, is this related to the movie? But otherwise, I was able to kind of picture, um, you know, images of Chernobyl or. Um, more recent kind of like nuclear disasters that I've heard and read about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a nice job of, of actually kind of, I, I felt really well situated by The Wizard of Oz and Chernobyl. Yeah. Um, whereas like the film itself, the, the scenes are pretty well, I think it assumes that we know about Chernobyl and I think it tells us what's going on in the film. Mm-hmm. Right. His wife tells the lens she could not have lived a different life. Right? I mean, that's a pretty, um, sorry, sorry. Um, mm-hmm. That's a pretty um, clear explanation of what it is that's going on in the film. Mm-hmm. Okay. How about the poem? Well, I know. And I wonder about this too, like, you're confronted with a piece of of art like this poem, right? That's making reference to another piece that you're unaware of. Do you feel moved to look it up? Right. And if looking it up and looking into it rewards or deepens, right. The, your, your appreciation is your experience of, of the poem. So, you know, I'm doing a little side Google here on the stalker, right. In in an unnamed country at an unspecified time, there's a fiercely protected post-apocalyptic wasteland known as the zone. Right. And then there's a guide and a writer and right. So, in some ways, like even if I don't go further in that plot summary, I get a sense of like the amplification of the tone and the setting of this poem, right? Um, I, well, did I you answer your own question I, there? I am super charmed by the note at the bottom. And I love shit that does that kind of integration. The fact that the stalker and the Wizard of Oz and Chernobyl are brought, brought together in a way mm-hmm. is fascinating but I only get the pleasure of that because it's in the note. Like the, the poem doesn't deliver yeah. for me the pleasure of that integration or combination or, or resonance. Mm-hmm. It just, it, it, it reads tightly and beautifully 
but it's not until the note do I does it open right up its craft that way. Right. And you read the note first and the notes at the yeah. bottom. But I'm wondering yeah. if you could also answer your own question there. If you were reading this on your own, can you honestly tell us whether you would have looked that up? Would you have looked up the stalker if you were just reading submissions? I might not have. Okay. I, I would have had it been at, at, at the top, right? And not a note, but like after, right? Have it be something like the zone after after Andre Tarkovsky's film Stalker, right? Mm -hmm. And then the note could give me Stalker mm -hmm. released in 79 seven years before Chernobyl and 40 years after the Wizard of Oz, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, just the anchoring at the top that this is an ekphrastic poem even, right? Right. right. Would have given me more grounding. Right. Well, I think it's a, it's a weird, I mean, I, I initially found it a very odd choice to have the note at the end. Mm -hmm. but it felt like you should know this going in, right? right? right. And so the fact that it comes at the end made me feel like I didn't need to know it. I mean, that was part of the, like, by the way, now that you've gone all the way through this, here are the pieces that mm -hmm. it's hung on. And somehow that actually made me feel like I didn't need to know it. Yeah. Okay. And Tarkovsky films are long. Right. Like, I mean, have you seen Andre Rublev? Like, I mean, it's a long movie. Right. So that means you're you not going to watch that, it? Right? That's a, that's <laughs> Why are you telling us that? You're telling us don't we, that you don't have the time for that? <laughs> I discovered you can watch. I have I have access to um, this movie database uh -huh. through, um, through, because I'm teaching a film class. Um and I can watch them at double speed. No, Jason. Uh -huh. <laughs> like if I'm trying to I'm going to show a film to a class, like I can get through it really quickly. And it's pretty exciting. To oh, oh, people are cringing all I know over people are going to be right really now. mad at it's, me, but I do it a lot because I can. And then I've seen twice as many movies as you, as you have. But no, I don't. what do you, you see the verb movie. seen? Like maybe that's true. <laughs> maybe you say, say them, the exact same thing. Really, right. right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Like I, I only know the, his film Solaris and that that's my only, you know, connection, I think with this director, but that's my own limited knowledge. Right. So, we, um, yeah. I want to yell at Jason. He hasn't been on in what? so long because I'm thinking he's a poet. <laughs> well, how would a poet feel if somebody told me, Oh, I've sped read all your books. I speed read. <laughs> I read the first um, the first line of every stanza. I get it. I get the gist. Right? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Back to this poem. I uh I yeah. I feel Mayor, like I hear you exactly that the idea of this is is amazing that those three things mm -hmm. together, but does the execution pay? Mm -hmm. I was just I was distracted by the note. I think mm. as I'm reading, when I read it, I think I like a lot of the images and I think I would have liked it, but I just don't, I can't go back in time. I've already read the note. Mm -hmm. I, w I wish I could have, I wish I would have read it after. Then I could say, well, we should just cut the note, but I don't have the access to that. Yeah. Experience Marion wants anymore. it at the top and you want it gone. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I mean, I read I it first without the note. It's so when it's I looked asking, at it for a podcast. And mm, I enjoyed I it more, actually. Mm. I did. Yeah. I like, I, I don't really like notes about stories and poems in general, unless it's, you know, in, in a rare case, it will heighten the experience or deepen mm -hmm. the experience or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if you've seen the movies, then you'll have a better reading of it. But it still should be there. Mm -hmm. And The Wizard of Oz to oh. me is... A little bit, not a little bit. It's kind of played out. And to me, it, there's not a lot of Wizard of Oz in this other than, where where was it? The When the House Landed on the Witch, it's never easy in a place of color. Uh -huh. And each leaf interrogates beauty is a killer line. Each leaf interrogates but beauty. I'm still distracted by the whole thing mm -hmm. from yeah. the note. Wait, and I, it didn't, it, I, I like the note where it is, and I, I feel like the pieces fit together. I mean, if, if I didn't have the note, I would probably assume 
that it was talking about an Ingmar Bergman film. Right. Right. His wife tells the lens she could not have lived a different life, right? I mean, that's so Ingmar Bergman, right? <laughs> I love that um, too, though. I love that. So in a certain way, like I just, I, I, I think that by placing it at the end, it sort of tells you like it's, it's there, but it's not. Um, you, you're you're okay, even if you haven't seen it. Hmm. Right. So I, then I, I, you know, all of these questions rise for me, which is like, I can almost hear, um, like, ima- or imagine Stephanie at a reading, right. And before she reads this poem, she's going to give the note, right. She's going to say, this is a poem about this thing and this thing and this thing, right. Like as some poets do, right. In terms of like framing a poem before they speak their poem. Right. But here it is on the page. Right. And I think the thing that we're debating fundamentally is, is it necessary information? Right. And if it's not necessary, right, then like the the project of the poem, like, I don't know, man, its presence on the page makes me want to peg this poem in a very specific genre and think of it as an ekphrasis. You take it away Mm -hmm. and then it's doing something else. Right. Which is um, really coding those references in a way that might not be discernible or decipherable to the reader. So, like, what is the experience like that the poet wants the reader to have here that for me gets a little bit fuzzy right um period right uh yeah that's what I'm saying. um we have one more guys so maybe we should vote but i mean are we are we talking too much about the note like should we talk about like is does that ultimately distract us from the poem can we like sort of like do we end up not talking about the poem because we're so kind of like focused on how to read the poem or what references we need for the poem well, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, right? Like, it's like, what is the experience that the poet wants the reader to have? Like, if do you want me directly engaged with the words on the page, right? Or do you want me doing the imaginative work of calling up those other texts in relationship to this piece, uh-huh. right? And I don't, I don't actually know. And and or does it fucking matter because the poem is so strong on its own that it it can be read without those references? So mm-hmm. that secondary experience we can right. do away with and just focus on the experience of the poem. Right. And, and I'm already hearing it. Like, you know, people are drawn to these really great lines. Each leaf interrogates, it's, it interrogates beauty. Right. Um, I don't know. So what do you think about, about your own question, Jason? What do you think? Um, I, I almost feel like I, I would want the, I, I kind of prefer the poem without the note, mm-hmm. but actually like when I, when I read it, like in the film before it happened, there's no answer. There's no question. What you wish for is better left unknown. The water they lie in flots and fishes like the the poem does such a good job of describing the film Mm -hmm. and connecting the film to other frames of reference like uh, downstream from the chemical plant it sleep it seeped their deaths into them um i don't i don't know that you have to pin that down to um like it, it describes it Right. I mean, we, we know everything we need to know. And then it almost feels more like this is what like Annie Dillard calls the pathway. Right. Like this is how you got there. Like mm-hmm. your, your reader doesn't really need to know that that's what you did to get to the poem. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So I, I actually I, I feel like I would I would very much like this. poem. I think I I like the poem and I think I'd like it more without the note. <laughs> OK. Uh, note note aside, I felt batted about. I felt. <laughs> You know, that I just thought of that phrase right now that I really did. It's like I was bouncing off walls a little bit, like in a corner. I I could not, not that I need a concrete narrative at all, but I I think that's why I started this by saying I felt like maybe if I saw the film, I'd quote unquote get it or something. I just wasn't given any sort of through line or place or... I felt I felt bad about reading this. The first three stanzas, I'm in, and I totally get that it's some sort of uh, Chernobyl type situation. Especially, you know, you get it happened years before, flotsam and fishes, and I'm completely down with it. And then when the house lands on the witch, I'm out, and I don't go back in because mm. I don't want to read anything about the Wizard of Oz ever again. <laughs> <laughs> See, because now, it's just a con it's just it's like okay here we go again and i'm yeah, done that doesn't bother me but like if i were to pull a tim on it there are stanzas i would get rid of so that i would have more of a through line you know yeah. uh, far enough inside the self there is no self outside 
what? Where did that come from? That doesn't even seem tonally like other moments. While he sleeps, their daughter moves his glasses with her mind. That is what really got me. I I don't know where that came from at all. Yeah. So, like, I think every time I feel like I'm settled, I get batted against the mm-hmm. wall again. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's something about Well, do that. we think the daughter got superpowers? I, don't I haven't know. seen the movie, so. I don't know. <laughs> if I were to pull a Tim, I would cut lines <laughs> four, six, seven, eight. <laughs> There's something about that damn last stanza, though, that the I just grinders. really love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's that? The last stanza? Yeah. Zoe likes to love that last stanza. Yeah. I hear you. <clears throat> the, meat, uh, the meat grinder, the last line. Line uh, 10. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff. Are you out completely? Yeah, but I think I'm still getting recorded. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the... Same. The atom bomb for me is the uh, the note, but then the the fallout is the four, six, seven, eight. Um, it's interesting that it's titled the zone because when you have real atomic blast zones, you have various types of destruction that seem to mimic what's going on here, with the epicenter being the note. But then you also have bands around atomic blast areas where you have people who are resistant to certain types of cancers and where plant life grows. And mm. I would just shave out all the funk, keep the, keep the sweet spots. <laughs> Cause the sweet spots for me are, are, um, they're super sweet spots. I love the sweet spots here. Mm-hmm. I just dislike the other parts <laughs> equally on the other side. <laughs> Anything? Anybody else? Shall we vote so we can move on to the third one? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. One, two, three, vote. Okay. So this one is not going to get in this time. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie Bolster. And we have one more after... Katrina, um, I'll do it unless somebody else wants to. No, I'm we, we're, I am. Yes, do it, do it. Okay, I so wish I could hear though myself. I mean, I'm, my my technology's screwing up, but it's weird how much. If you have headphones on, you can't hear yourself. I'm going to do this death. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. After Katrina, the front steps left behind when the barge took the house six blocks, six blocks. The mind strains and tears from its backing. A floater goes off into that vitreous bit forever, though eventually it'll settle lower in the field of vision. Eleven years later, the steps. Off the coast, 50,000-year-old cypresses still smell fresh if cut. Back when they lived here, they made earth here before channels quickened the route for freight and made the water salt, they made a place. Soap in a wrap, a sleeve on the glass, the sheets knew each time. 11 years later, two sevenths lower nine schools reopened. Next door in St. Bernard Parish, all schools back in two years. Walk the streets, look at their faces. Some of the rebuilt projects look like Disney World. Okay. So this one uh, is set up very differently than the others. We have uh, five stanzas with little asterisks inside. I mean, in between. And plenty, plenty, plenty of white space. Uh, That last line, some of the rebuilt projects look like Disney World, stands alone. So, what think we? I felt like a lot of this was very familiar in terms of the imagery around um, New Orleans after Katrina. Like, I, I felt like there were some really great places, but it didn't feel personal. In a certain way, 
Um, the other ones felt like they kind of had this very deep personal investment. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. other than the sheets knew each time, um, things felt distant. Things felt um, like at a much farther remove. Whereas like in the other two poems, there was this very strong concern about how identity is and is not itself. And in this one, I, I felt I felt kind of uh, I, I felt like I was seeing, you know, slides in a slideshow about the mm-hmm. aftermath of of Katrina. Interesting. That's an interesting way to describe it, and the fact that these are uh, set up like fragments, you know, goes with that. I sort of see a now I see the pacing of a PowerPoint going by or a slideshow, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I definitely agree that this is more distant than the other ones, especially within um, what's it one, two, the fourth stanza, mm-hmm. last line, walk the streets, look at their faces. I would have loved a little bit more description of the faces. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's a really like puzzling penultimate stanza, right? 11 years later, two out of seven lower nine schools reopened. At least that's how I want to read that line, right? Next door in St. Bernard Parish, all schools back in two years, right? Walk the streets, look at their faces. I, you know, I don't actually know what the idea is there Mm -hmm. other than like, is there like a, a, a wicked discrepancy between these two parishes based on what, like the economics or the the right. demographics, yeah. but then walk the streets, look at their faces, whose faces and it, and which group, all of them. Like I, I get a little confused in it, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that also adds to that kind of editorial newspaper mm. reporter feel of it. Like this is a piece on kind of the discrepancies of rebuilding um, New Orleans based on race or socioeconomics. And I think look at their faces does point to like something racial. Mm-hmm. Uh, listeners sometimes when we go (laughs) quiet you're not having technological difficulties (laughs) we're thinking (laughs) that is the sound of thinking Mm -hmm. (laughs) i was going to say also about the disney world at first i read that as a negative as in kind of, um, you know, a fakeness or a plastic quality. Sometimes sure. where Marion and I live in, in the UAE is called a, a Disney world, um, as, you know, as a, a negative term, but mm-hmm. I now wonder if actually it meant was meant completely negative or if she was implying that like those schools that were rebuilt are, are like nicely done and look clean and well. And like, the one, the areas that are, that are still, you know, um, devastated, like, you know, look the opposite of a Disney world are in disarray is still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's so funny how quiet we are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, Jason, I think, We'll just keep saying the same thing. That's why we're being quiet. This is they, they, they. Of course we have a distance if it's them. Right? hmm Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I love the cypresses. And I love, mm-hmm. like, that's kind of the only moment, like, that in the sheets. But uh, outside of that, I feel um, disconnected. Yeah, I hear you. I feel like I feel like an observer and I don't feel like I'm sort of mm-hmm. I don't feel as you know, coming at it from inside. Right. I, I, don't, I don't feel intimately drawn in. Right. There's an intimacy. In Which that is third. so fascinating. When you look back at that first stanza, like the, the maneuvers there are really something else. Right. So the the speaker is confronted right by the image of these steps that are left behind when a boat pushes a house six blocks away. And then that notion, like the mind strains, like to even understand what that means, the fact of it. Right. Sure. And then that move to the floater for a second, you think boats, but no, it's actually that 
the black thing in your eye, right. Mm -hmm. Floating off in the distance. So you're, you're so focused on the self as lens, so to speak, like the lenses of your own damn eye become the object here. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back out to 11 years later, the steps, right? So this, this, this really complicated positioning of this person, the speaker doing the description as the lens for what's being seen. Right. Mm -hmm. But then that, that gets set up, but then it, it doesn't, that it's, that's not a a mechanism for anything Mm -hmm. other than this, the the descriptions that follow. Right. Um, And I I guess I'm I'm super charmed by the implications of that image. And I I don't feel like a, um, the poet dwells there very long. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like by the end with Disney world, the poet kind of tells us what to think. I mean, once yeah. some looks like yeah. Disney World, we know the message and then we're not coming to it on our own terms. Mm-hmm. We're yeah. not forced to dig like we are in the first mm-hmm. two paragraphs. And like Sam yeah. just said, it's kind of interesting. What does Disney World, you know, I guess it's kind of a quiller or a hipper to say that just means faux and, and garish even. Right. But someone could also look at that as as, you know, beautiful and immaculate mm-hmm. and and. So even right, she's say t- giving telling us what to think, but we might think different things. And I'm th- like Mary, thank you so much for the way you described and went into depth on that first stanza. The the mind strains and tears from its backing. Mm-hmm. I, I was so hooked, mm-hmm. and and but then I think it's the long distance looks that push me away again. You know, when the mm-hmm. when the camera or the eye goes far away. Because, mm-hmm. you know, Jason used the word intimacy. That third stanza, soap in a wrap, a sleeve on the glass, the sheets new each time. That's a beautiful, intimate moment, right? And what I think about, I might be crazy, but what I think about is uh, when people were being housed in different places, maybe, and they were given, mm-hmm. you know, little mm-hmm. hotel soaps, a, the plastic sleeve on the glass, like that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, I guess it doesn't mean any hotel, but I was thinking more of, uh, I don't know, whatever. This was the most close up and intimate moment of the of the piece, even even mm-hmm. though it's mm-hmm. less to do with the flood, really, or the. Mm. Mm. Well, guys, we are TikToking here now. Might we, <laughs> might we vote or? Yeah, let's let's go ahead and vote. Okay, let's do it. One, two, three, vote. Results are coming in, and this is a no go. So, Stephanie Bolster, starting at the top, we got ancestors for our. Um, Next issue, Yay. and we're so great. Which great poem. What? Love, love, love. Yeah. Such a great poem. Absolutely. Such a great poem. Absolutely. We could have talked about that maybe the whole 45 minutes. But um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to say to anybody, to our slushies? Which is that using that term now because that's what our listeners voted on. Our, our fans now call themselves slushies. Yes. Slushies. <laughs> Yes. Love it. Sorry, I know love you it. love peeps, Jason, as the actual candy, but <laughs> we yeah, yeah, slushies yeah. one. I, like I think slushies does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have anything to say? Uh, uh, nothing other than I'm so glad that Samantha mentioned they're there. That's the second time in less than 24 hours that I've heard of. Is it? Is it Tommy Orange? Yeah. Um, yeah. His mm-hmm. book. Yeah. Which is saying something because I've been traveling like back to Abu Dhabi in the, over the last 36 hours. So it's really <laughs> kind of amazing that that's what has been like echoing. But that, that, that book, that title, I'm going to get it on my reading list immediately. Okay. So thank Definitely you. Well, I'll, well, I'll do that. Um, um, have a book club. Uh, if you're interested in kind of like urban, like Native American life, it's, it's really great. And the writing is strong. It's, I love awesome. it. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, slushies, mm-hmm. let us know how we're doing. Uh, tell us what you think and um, enjoy the Instagrams from Zoe <laughs> while they last. Yay, Zoe. <laughs> thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, thank you very much. And keep on reading. Woo! Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo!